the Triathlon Show 384. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Dio Sanders. Dio is a coach at Ineos Grenadiers and a sports scientist with Maastricht University. And in this interview, we will discuss his coaching and training philosophy, how he works within Ineos, and uh, what it's like, uh, what training at that level is like, and uh, many, many more topics. Uh, but before we get into that, big thanks to our sponsors, uh, Form. The Form Smart Swim Goggles give you real-time feedback in your swim training through a display on the goggle lens. You can see your splits and your average pace for the intervals, and you can see other variables like stroke rate and even heart rate through integration with polar heart rate monitors. And all of this helps executing your swim workouts better and also makes them more fun and engaging. In the Form app, you can also get access to in-depth post-swim analysis and uh, your work Workouts uh, sync seamlessly, seamlessly to platforms like Training Peaks, Strava, Today's Plan, and Final Surge. The app also has a vast library of workouts and training plans, or you can build your own guided workouts. You can get 15% off the goggles with the code TTS15 on formswim.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate. The Senate Indoor Swim Trainer is a unique dry land swim trainer that allows you to improve your technique, power, and swim training consistency. It is a perfect tool to complement your pool and open water swimming, as it allows you to do very specific power and technique technique work, including working on your catch and your core activation, and it makes it easier to stay consistent even when you can't go to the pool. You can try the Senate risk-free for up to 30 days, so if you don't love it, just send it back, and you get a special TTS bundle including the swim bench and a bunch of Senate training plans and on-demand workouts on senatehunter.com forward slash TTS. Now without any further ado, here's my interview with Dio Sanders. Welcome to the Traffler Show, Dio. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Um, thanks for the invite. I've been a keen listener to the podcast for the last couple of years, so it's a pleasure to be on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, let's start with uh, more of an introduction and a background. Can you tell us more about uh, how you came to be in the roles that you currently have and uh, yeah, what your interests within endurance sports are? Yeah, I guess maybe to start firstly with... Uh, the cycling side of things or where the interest from cycling comes from and that's yeah, cycling is something i've been passionate about from yeah, an early age so i started racing when i was yeah quite young um raced all through the youth categories and um progressed through the juniors on a 23 also did some international races um so for example the last few years as on a 23 i did some like continental level races or point uh, point two races so basically cycling has been a very big part of my life from an early age and something i'm very yeah passionate about um so that's where that comes from um then i've always been super interested in yeah in training already when i was racing myself looking at things to yeah try to be better in in training basically and that actually eventually led me to pursue a degree in human movement sciences. So I did a bachelor's and master's in Maastricht University. Um, and also actually at the time when I was studying, um, because I had this interest in training and because I was doing the degrees, that's also sor sort of when my coaching journey started. So actually when I was still racing as an under 23 cyclist, I started yeah, coaching juniors. Um, so basically we had yeah these two things going on at the same time was doing my degree but also story already with advising um a junior cyclists so basically i got to this point where i recognized i didn't have the talent to become a professional cyclist so then i just yeah, and i was very passionate about also the coaching and the training side of things so then yeah, i made the decision to yeah fully focus on that um so after my degrees i moved to the uk did a phd in sports science and with again the research being entirely focused on on cycling basically also did some collaborations with professional cycling teams um after i finished my phd work for one year in at a university in scotland where i was sort of sports science coordinator and after that basically i started working uh, within uh, world tour cycling teams so did one year in in scotland and then i moved to dimension data um worked there for one year then i moved over to 
what's now called Team DSM, but used to be Team Sunweb at the time. Worked there for a couple of years and then um, yeah, was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to um, yeah, move to a, a new team in EOS Canadiers, which I've yeah, now have my first season with them basically. And I'm yeah, really enjoying being part of part of this new team. But um, yeah, I think that's a little bit my background from starting as a cyclist to sort of working within still within the sport. And uh, one follow-up question on that. So when when you quit your your own cycling career uh, as a career prospect, did you still keep training? And is that something you still do to this day? Or did you kind of stop with your own cycling and just focus on the coaching and the research at that point? Yeah, I've, I've, I've always been yeah, training myself still, but obviously not, not anymore to the level I was at before. Um, actually, when I just stopped, I remember that winter, I was still doing a lot of training actually just because it's so part of your routine and then actually when i moved to the uk and obviously with the whole move and everything it became a and getting used to a new uh, new country my training took a bit of a backseat for a while I went into running a little bit more actually at the time um but yeah i, I still yeah, try to stay as active as possible it's probably a bit more running nowadays because it's a bit easier to implement when you have a busy lifestyle um i also still I go to the gym as well but yeah like my goal was always to stay active but it's it's not as easy anymore as it was before yeah and uh currently you are working as a as a coach with Ineos Grandiers so can can you tell us more about uh, about that role yeah sure um so yeah I, I guess the role is just what you would typically expect from yeah what a coach's role would entail so basically I'm yeah, kind of responsible for the physical preparation of the riders that I'm, uh, yeah, that I'm coaching, and you can see that obviously from two sides. So one element is just yeah the the conditioning side of things. So that obviously includes the training prescription, uh, the training planning, both on a like, short term, so day to day basis, and and long term sort of macro periodization perspective. Um, that obviously plays an important role. What my day to day role entails. Then obviously you have the coaching from a you know, wider performance perspective, so perhaps more the psychological side of things, um, where obviously the athlete coach relationship is key and developing that in a good way and supporting them as much as possible from this this side. Um, yeah, that alongside that, yeah, as the coach, you're also then the main contact point for everything related to their performance. So yeah, it's almost perhaps a little bit like a project manager, I guess. So we have a great performance support department within the team with the aerodynamics, nutritionists, data analysts, uh, sports scientists, etc. And obviously, and then as the coach, I try to work with these guys as much as possible and in an optimal way to yeah, support the performance uh, from a wider picture. Um, and alongside there's some yeah other things that you're going to be responsible for. So training camp organization and support during training camps and um also going to races and being sort of a support from a coaching side of things on races as well. Um, so I think that, yeah, that would be a bit of a summary of what the role would entail. And how does it work specifically? Do you have, are you the personal coach of X number of riders on the team? And then you have a few other coaches that, that have a similar um, role as you do, or is it more collaborative with the multiple coaches working together? Basically, it is that you get assigned an X amount of riders where then you're the personal coach of, basically. Um, and those are the riders that you're going to be working with yeah, all year long. Um, and then we have multiple coaches within yeah, the team that, that have an assignment of a, of a certain amount of riders. Um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of the system, what it works from, from a general perspective. So you do the training planning, training prescription for those uh, athletes that – yeah, you are assigned to basically, but obviously there's going to be times where I might be the lead coach at a training camp. And then it's not only the riders that I got assigned, basically the riders that I'm personally coaching that are going to be at that camp. So obviously there's going to be times where, yeah, I guess you, you also support the athletes that you're not per se the personal coach of, but generally it's, yeah, you focus predominantly on, on the riders that, um, that you're personally coaching. Mm. And uh, when new riders join the team, how are they assigned to a coach? Is it based on 
what who who decides that or how does that process work yeah it's a bit of a there's not like a set system or a set process in place for that i think it goes there's just multiple factors considered um it might be that there is already a previous relationship in place so it might be an athlete that you're at, that i already know or an athlete that i work with in the past and if that was yeah a good relationship or that worked out quite well then obviously it would yeah then you wouldn't want to ignore that so then it might be a good way again to connect again with that athlete it might also be something similar uh, simple like a language thing so if there's a dutch or belgian rider it might make sense that i also then work with them that doesn't mean that every dutch rider i would i would then per se be the coach of but there's just yeah multiple um things that we that you would consider um and it might also be that yeah, if you're a new coach in a team that you might already be assigned more of the riders that are new to the team as well because some of the coaches that were ready in a team might already have a certain amount of riders that they were working with so it's yeah it's there's not like a set system in place it goes a little bit based on, on multiple factors yeah and uh in terms of the coaching being remote but also face-to-face in terms of training camps and sometimes even at races can you tell us more about that how how often do you see your riders at training camps how often do you go to races and and so mm. on yeah i think with with him within the with Ineos so or the current team i'm working with they, they really yeah, advocate that you try to see your riders as much as possible and they really yeah um try to support you in the best way possible with that obviously the nature of being an endurance coach nowadays is that you're gonna you're gonna do a lot of things remotely and obviously we're quite fortunate that we have the ability to do so and it's especially within world tour cycling where at least live all over the world basically and you might be based somewhere so it's not like you have a central base like you might have in other sports so that's automatically gonna yeah, force you to do a lot of things remotely but then yeah we like, try to look for as much as uh, as many opportunities to actually try to see yeah, the athletes that you're working with and it, it varies a little bit throughout the year um so for example in the yeah in this phase of the year um, I'm largely following some riders that I coach that uh, move towards the Giro d'Italia. So then we have like training camps in preparation for that and um, races in preparation for that. And now I'm largely yeah, coupled with that sort of uh, lineup. So then automatically the riders that are on that, that are preparing for a Giro, I'm going to see uh, a lot more. And I've yeah, I've seen them quite a bit actually in the last couple of months. Saw them at December training camp, then we January altitude camp, um, then went to race in February. Also now just went to a race in March and we go to another altitude camp. So then I actually see them quite a lot. Um, and then I just look for mm. if there's riders that are not per se part of that stream, I just look for opportunities to meet up with them. So either fly out to see them or yeah, just basically look for opportunities to, to meet up. Um, so it's, it's not always, it's all, sometimes a bit of a puzzle because you try to align different programs. Some of, some of them are going to different races. So we try to make things, make sure that it's sort of aligns that all the riders that I'm coaching, I can, yeah, I can see as regular as possible. Yeah. Um, so let's move into some coaching questions. Uh, firstly, if you can give an overview of the way that you think about coaching and training, uh, I realize that it's a <laughs> bit of a, a general and, and difficult question, but, uh, give it your best shot. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's not an easy one because it's, yeah, you can, you need to answer it quite wide, I guess. Um, but I, I guess yeah, the bottom line is is that you want to make the riders that you're working with better. And yeah, I would say I would like to approach it from like a, a holistic point of view to look at different areas, if it's like the physical side of things or the psychological side of things, areas that you just want to focus on to make this athlete that, that you're working with a, a better cyclist. Um, Obviously, one important part of that is what I also just mentioned is sort of the physical or conditioning side of things. Um, but then on the other hand, it's having them in the right state of mind psychologically to perform. And then yeah, it will depend, I guess, slightly on the rider or if you're going to put more emphasis on one or the other. They all need to do good training, of course. But for, perhaps you have to put a bit more emphasis on more of the, yeah, the coaching side of things, I guess, with some athletes if they require that. Um, so if, if I would... Yeah, summarize how I would approach it. I think firstly, from a coaching perspective, you need to yeah, build a good relationship with the athlete. Um, the rider should have trust in the coach they're working with. 
And it's also clear in the research that a yeah, strong athlete coach relationship is yeah, fundamental for in the development of a rider, basically, and for them to perform. And that's, I guess, is also something you, it's more of a skill that you have to learn over time how to best develop that. It's not something that you get taught in university. Um, so I guess it's more of a, a softer skill, but that's a yeah, very important part that you have to have to recognize. And then secondly, of course, is the, yeah, the physical side of things, sort of typical, yeah, what you would expect from a coach with training programs, pres- training prescription. And how that for me is defined is, um, of what defines a pro- training program for me is on one hand, the rider characteristics, and on the other hand, the uh, event demands. So if, if you look at the event demands, if you look at yeah, obviously road cycling is one sport, but there's a lot of different specializations going on within the sport. So you can have a climber, you can have a sprinter. They're both a road cyclist, but obviously the, the demands for their spe- uh, respective uh, specializations can be quite different than the the parameters of importance for those two specializations are also different. So then the training should be aligned with the goals you're trying to achieve. So if for a climber, obviously the, the main, uh, one of the most important parameters of success is that they can produce a high power output for long durations, high relative power output. So um, power to body weight for longer durations. Well, for a sprinter, obviously the, the parameters of importance are going to be different. So their ability to do uh, a 10 to 15 second max sprint at the end of a race is going to be the decisive factor for success. So that's something when I approach a training program, obviously something I have to take into account. So defining what the goal is and trying to break down that goal in the most detail possible. So what the parameters of importance are. Um, And then secondly, what you don't have to understand is what the athlete that you have in front of you. So what the individual characteristics are of that athlete. So yeah, everybody is different. They have all different physiological profiles, different training age, different biological age, different strengths and weaknesses. And if you combine those two, so you do combine the event demands with the parameters of importance, and you then have your individual characteristics, then you can start to look at, okay, how can we bridge the gap between how good the athlete currently is to yeah, how good we want them to be? So and you try to answer the question, what focus point in training um, is going to improve the probability of that rider being successful within that specialization. Um, and I think that's, that's obviously it's quite a, a general overview of how I would approach training, but that's that, that would be the system I go through every time. So try to break down the goal and try to evaluate the individual in the most detail possible and then putting those two elements together to determine what, what the focus, what, what the, yeah, focus points and training are going to be. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that it, it uh, what you said there earlier about it's almost like being a project manager, uh, what you describe now kind of uh, harkens back to, to that a little bit, not just with the physical preparation, but also the things you said with working together with uh, nutritionists and the aerodynamicists and everything. And of course, it's a privilege as a coach to have those resources, but also it's a responsibility to use them correctly, I guess, and prioritize correctly for each individual athlete and their characteristics and their event demands. So uh, so I think that that was a good description, the, the project manager mm-hmm. description. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to, or, or the one thing I wanted to ask about there is do you coaches at the world tour level have special specializations like the riders do? Do you have some coaches that are really comfortable working with climbers versus with sprinters or is it, are you all fairly well-rounded in that you can work with these different types of rider specializations? Yeah, I think there are at least from what I know from other teams, there are some coaches within other teams that would, for example, specialize a little bit more with a certain rider group. And often that's predominantly uh, determined by that coach having success with it within that specialization. So if you have a, a coach who's been very successful with sprinters, then that then tends to happen automatically. Is that also from a team's perspective, you would like to put the sprinters with this coach because he has a lot of experience with that. Same goes for if a, if a coach has been quite successful with preparing GC riders for a Grand Tour, for example. Um, and if you get a, I know, a new good GC 
talent within your team that you would be more prone to yeah pushing perhaps towards that coach but i would say generally and that's at least how i yeah would strive to be is that i um i'm not per se specialized within one rider group it's yeah i would like to work with different athletes and um like to be able to coach different different athletes and even obviously within a certain group within a group of sprinters you're going to have these different individual characteristics as i mentioned before that you have to tailor for but um yeah so so to answer your question i think there will there is some specialization perhaps with some coaches that focus more on a specific area but yeah, for me personally i like to yeah, work with a more variety of, of different athlete profiles yeah um so the next question uh, i'm interested in hearing what are things that you do different now inter as a coach when you prescribe training compared to what you did yourself as a young cyclist coming through the under 23 ranks and so on yeah that's a good question i for sure made quite some mistakes uh, during during that time um i think perhaps if i if i think back about dennis about perhaps i appreciate now more is that now i can as a coach i, I can consider all the stressors that an athlete is facing and i appreciate that there's more stressors than just training and i think when i was um yeah sort of i was coaching myself basically but when i was yeah, training and riding at, at that time I, I don't think i always appreciated the influence of of the other stressors so for for example when i was under 23 i was like working in a sports store i was doing my university degree and then i was also uh training and you know, so that that's tried quite a few things that you try to balance and yeah sometimes i think i should have had a better understanding when it's time to push and when it's time to rest but obviously if you had a it's been quite a stressful few days at university and you're working as well and it's obviously going to have an impact on your recovery and yeah sometimes i was probably just more prone to just stick to the plan and just do the efforts that were that i was thinking of doing and now obviously i have a yeah, better of better appreciation of sometimes it's better to not push through when it doesn't feel right but i think that's that's a challenge anyway when you're self-coached even if you have uh, all the knowledge in the world it's sometimes difficult then to sort of have that helicopter view and you know make a better objective assessment of what's going on um so i think that's perhaps i now i have a better appreciation of considering all stressors and having knowing when it's time to push on and when not so i think i definitely learned from from that um i think one other thing i can think of is that i was at the time i was obviously reading all the literature because i was doing my degree and i tried to be as science-based with my training with my own training program as well and i remember the literature then said or it still says i think that from like a taper perspective it's advised to reduce volume by i don't think 40 to 60 percent or something um which is something that i was just applying then i think okay i need to reduce my volume this week by this percentage because that's what the, the research said and when i look back now I, I and also in my own practice right now i don't really apply that to that extent i think that's it's perhaps a bit too aggressive at reducing the volume and also from because when i've applied this i've often not seen the desired performances i would like to see on the race day um because i think perhaps the balance between the previous load they were doing and the d load might even be a little bit too high but on the other hand if you have a lot of race days so often as on a 23 cyclist you have like one race in the weekend so you, you know you can't be tapering all the time you have to make decisions when you're going to be training through and when when you're going to taper down so yeah i think that's perhaps something i can think of that i would have would have done different but there's a lot of things that if i could coach myself now with the with the experience i have now i would do a lot of things different but it's uh in the end i wouldn't change it because there's a lot of mistakes i made that i really learned a lot from and it really helps me now with my at my coaching practice nowadays so yeah yeah no that's a good answer and uh are there things that you uh do in your coaching that might be different than than what you perceive as being let's say more common within uh what the majority of let's say riders and coaches uh on the world tour do and anything that you've that would stick out well, that's a difficult one i don't i can't really think about one element that i would do 
that I'm like completely different to other coaches, I would say. I think in the end, I think if you're, if you have the good coaches that are in the world tour in principle, they do a lot of things quite similarly. Also, like, let's say I start working with new, with a new athlete and they have been in the world tour before you get access to their training data. You often also get an idea what their training prescription has been before and yeah, like th there's for sure always these little things where I would, okay, maybe I would balance it a little bit different, but in principle, there, there will be yeah similar things that are done. The only thing yeah, that will be different between different coaches is just that everybody has a slightly different style. Um, some might be very prescriptive in their training. Some might be very open. Um, but yeah, I've seen riders perform with a quite wide variety of coaching strategies and I've seen coaches been successful with different styles. I think in the end, you just need to have a goal in mind what you want to achieve um, with the athlete, both from a physical and general athlete perspective. And then, yeah, how you achieve that, that they can be coaches with, with different styles, basically. Um, but yeah, perhaps one, something I can think about, or at least how I'd like to look at the training is that I, I like to think ahead. So I think that perhaps fits a little bit with my personality, but I always like to have a bit of a template or a blueprint plan in place for at least the next two weeks. Um, sometimes that's not possible because I might be waiting for a certain race decision or whatever, but I always like to have at least something in place or at least like a weekly structure when we're going to train and when we're going to have days off. And then I will, yeah, just come into the reactive phase and make small adjustments depending on how, yeah, how he's getting through the plan. But so, that, but that's just more of a style, I guess. I also know some coaches that prefer to approach it more on a short-term basis, um, and being i would say even more reactive and yeah they've they've also had success with that so i think in the end you just need to see what works for you and what you think works best for your athlete um, and then yeah, you will find a way yeah how far ahead would you have some kind of uh blueprint or at least an idea that maybe in this period you want to be focusing on volume versus uh focusing on intensity or focusing on i don't know going to altitude like basically even if you don't know the the weekly the the, the schedule for the week will, will you know, do you know that a couple of months from now you want this athlete to be doing a high volume block or or something like that generally yes but like at least from a starting point like I, i'm a big uh yeah believer or fan of creating uh, like an annual plan or make like an annual planner where um like let's say the process would be is that when we get off the off season in october then already the discussion is starting to happen about the race program for the next year and then when you get towards the end of the year let's say around december then you would already have a bit of a yeah a draft race program for the athletes that you're going to be working with for that next year there's going to be some races where there's like a long list so there's no guarantee per se that they're going to be racing that event but yeah, you will be in a position that you have an idea what races are going to be doing at what time. So that would be my starting point to put that draft program in for the whole season, basically. And then I start to, um, and alongside that program actually, we'll also have like the planning of the altitude camps that we want to do, especially when we move into like the key goals of the year, like the Grand Tours. And then I would, what I would do in that planner is have like an overall overview on like a macro level on what we would focus on at what point when we're going to take some time off so perhaps you split the season in three phases you're going to have a phase where you're going to have a large focus on volume and mainly aerobic development there's going to be a, a specific phase here's going to be an altitude camp this might be a good window to do a metabolic test all these different things i just try to plan out and in this sort of annual cycle um and to try to do that as much detail as possible with the information I have at the time. And I, yeah, I'm a big believer of having a plan like that in place because it really gives you sort of a red line throughout your training program. So what to focus on at what time, but obviously always things are going to happen. So things are going to change. So it's likely that you're not going to be able to fit to your annual plan exactly, but at least it's it going to give you an idea. You plan for your recovery moments. You're going to plan for your base blocks, your build blocks and, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And that gives you then every time I make my day to day plan, I would always have this sort of annual planner alongside it to again, remind me of, yeah, what 
uh, and what sort of phase we're in looking at the whole year. Um, yeah, so it's the main thing I, I would create that planner, but I would always be reactive. Then, of course, we need to make adjustments. And maybe I had a certain focus point in mind for a certain month. Maybe I will adjust it based on the responses I see in, in training or in the races. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer of creating creating such an annual annual planner. Mm. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned there before was that some coaches are a bit more open and some are more prescriptive. Where uh, would you say that you fall on that spectrum? Yeah, it's, it's. I think it's a combination of both. Like in general, I would say I would be quite prescriptive in sort of the type of efforts I would be doing, effort duration, rest between efforts. Um, the only thing I would be more open with depending on the session is like what how the intensity would be set so for sometimes i might i might want to be quite prescriptive so let's say um we've done a physiological assessment and we have a bit of an idea okay this is where the maximal fat oxidation occurs uh, for this athlete if we then want to do a session to specifically work on that obviously you want to be a bit more prescriptive to not go over that point so if you i don't know let's say we define it between 280 and 300 watts then obviously we prescribe also efforts within that range um because if you go over that sort of number then we know that the physiology is going to change and then that's then not in line with the physiological goal we had in mind so there might be instances where i would be quite prescriptive on that front but there might also be instances especially with the higher intensity um type training where I wouldn't necessarily put like a certain power number on on the effort. And then perhaps I would give more an RPE or tell them to go more by feel. And that's mainly for two reasons. One, to um, not put a, a limiter on the session. So let's say he has an, we still can't really predict how, how an athlete is going to be on that day. He might be able to do higher than you were expecting um, or he might not have his best day. So he might not be achieving what you were expecting. But then... Yeah, if you put a, a number on it and they can't achieve it, they might feel like the session has failed. That's not a good outcome. If you put a certain number down and it's too easy for them, it might also not be the best of what you had in mind for that session. So I guess it's a little bit of a, a combination of both. Um, some points I want to be quite prescriptive and sometimes I want to yeah, have it have it more open. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and... Uh... Yeah, moving into some some very typical questions to uh, dig a bit deeper into various aspects of endurance training. Uh, firstly, what are your thoughts on volume and intensity, and how to balance the two? Um, yeah, so I think yeah. Firstly, if you want, my philosophy is if you want to be a good endurance athlete, you need a high volume, and that's going to be yeah one of the most important things to yeah, to work on. So basically getting the work done in a consistent way. Yeah. That that's yeah, going to make you a better endurance athlete. And I also believe that if you can progressively increase your volume year by year, sort of in a healthy way, so not without making somebody excessively fatigued, I think you're going to make them a better endurance athlete. Um, yeah. By increasing the volume because it's just, obviously the science is quite clear and a lot of these adaptations, I don't know, morphological or physiological, they just take this, yeah, high volume of contractions um, yeah, to basically create these adaptations. So generally, I would say every road cyclist should have a high volume, or every endurance alley should have a high volume. But the, the question is, of course, how high and then how much intensity are you going to do within that volume? And I think that's going to be back to what I said before, is that for me, sort of that what defines a training program is the rider characteristics and the event demands and that's going to determine what i'm going to focus on in training and not per se like a set intensity distribution or perhaps or even a set volume um so, so for example let's say we, we have a young cyclist coming to the team and he has been training i don't know 600 hours or 700 hours so my my first basic assessment would be that if we want to increase the probability of this rider to become a successful well-rounded professional cyclist where you have to tolerate grand tours you have to tolerate these hard one-week stage races um i think we would have to increase that volume to increase the probability of, of making him that well-rounded professional cyclist so then um 
to do that in a sustainable way, moving up the volume, I might actually be a bit more careful with the intensity to start with, to just allow that volume to increase in a, in a healthy way and perhaps get more intensity from the races, uh, et cetera, that he would be doing. Um, so uh, typically juniors, they would have like a more intense, lower volume approach. And then if they would come to the world, for example, I would then make a little bit of a shift and trying to increase that volume and perhaps reducing the intensity somewhat. But if on the other hand, you have an experienced cyclist who's a bit older, who's been training, I don't know, 1100 to 1200 hours for multiple years, then you have that foundation is that sort of solid that perhaps the key to see further development with this athlete is to try to add some more intensity within that, that volume that he has. Um, and then obviously what efforts you're going to be focusing on that would then be dependent on yeah, sort of specialization and, and individual characteristics and perhaps the gap that you identify. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's generally, I believe in a high volume approach and for me, the intensity distribution would be, it would be, it would be, it wouldn't be set. It would be more of a, of a consequence to the training focus points I would have. So it's not that I start up my training program and I think, okay, we need to have a pyramidal intensity distribution. So we need to accumulate this amount of time in this zone. That's yeah, not how I, I would see it working. If I have a, I don't know, a specific phase for an athlete where I believe that a, that a threshold efforts would be of benefit in this four week block, then I'm going to implement more threshold intervals. And that's then going to result in a different intensity distribution. And if I had a different physical goal, so yeah, that's, a little bit how I would, would approach it. So I, do, I wouldn't start with a set. I don't believe in like one set intensity distribution that's going to be effective for every endurance athlete. I would see it more of a consequence of the training goals you have. Yeah, no, that makes sense. With the volume, in that example, with the, let's say the junior rider, six, 700 hours, how would you, first of all, what would be your kind of assessment that it, where do they need to go and would you take them there within one the first season already or would you build up over two or more seasons yeah this is i always find this a bit of a tricky one because firstly like how what the annual volume is going to be is also largely going to be determined by sort of the types of racing they're going to be doing if they're going to do a lot of stage races where they're going to have these high volume weeks that's going to automatically push it up uh, already a little bit more so I also don't have like one set rule. Okay, we need to in, increase it by, I don't know, 200 hours a year or something like that. Um, but yeah, going, for example, from 600 hours straight to 1,000 hours, which would be, yeah, a good amount of volume for a professional cyclist. That's that's perhaps a bit of a st steep increase. So perhaps you would sit somewhere in the middle to start with. And then I guess it becomes a bit more of an iterative process throughout the year to see what they can tolerate. Um, and sometimes I've been surprised that if working with young cyclists, how much training they can tolerate. So it's actually not a problem to move it up quite rapidly, but yeah, it's, you, I would adjust it a little bit along the way and probably sit a little bit more on the cautious side with, with increasing it to start with. And then based on their response, perhaps make further increases. Yeah. And, and on the intensity side, um, in cycling, it's, difficult because there are so many race days and and that of, of course impacts the training you can do but let's say you have a period where um your rider is in a training block maybe focusing building towards a grand tour or something and we don't really need to worry about necessarily what type of rider it is but how would you do you have like a weekly template that you fit in two or three intense sessions within the week and that's kind of standard or or how do you think about the frequency of including intensity in the program yeah it's a good question and again the answer it's, it's a bit tricky because it really depends on yeah where you're going to be in 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 their preparation basically and if let's say if you're going to be between certain races then yeah how how that looks like from a week to week basis might be completely different than if you have a longer block um longer block going in but yeah, it's it's for me. I would say it it varies quite a bit. So, for example, if we're in a specific preparation towards a Grand Tour, um, let's say we do a three week altitude camp leading up to that, then already because of the altitude, you have the adaptation days in the first week. So then, actually, that first week, you might not do any 
what's considered high intensity at all. Then in the second week, you might actually progress that and might add one towards the end. And then maybe in the last week, you have more of that implemented. So it, it does vary a little bit, but I would, in general, if I, if I would look back also at my training prescription, I would probably say to, I wouldn't do more than two really high intensity sessions throughout the week. But I always find it a bit, because it's tricky to say what's actually a high intensity session, because if you look at, yeah. Yeah, that's you look at the three zone model, then obviously you have uh, low is everything below the first sort of threshold. And then you have moderate between the first and second threshold and high is everything above your, your, your second threshold, so to speak, or critical power or whatever you want to call it. But, but like, is it then if you only include intensity above that critical power, if, is that then truly a high intensity session? Because you can make a very hard session with more moderate intensity. So that it's then sometimes a little bit hard to quantify because I've, I've actually tried to do it with one recent study as yeah. well, where we look back. When, when, when I, when, when I, when I asked the question, I, I kind of include those hard, hard demanding sessions with moderate intensity. I do include that as something that I would consider hard. So, you know, your threshold or sweet spot intervals or yeah. even like long tempo rides, things, things like that. But then there is, of course, there is a gray area there maybe with kind of fat max type efforts that might be close to that lower end of zone two yeah. then yeah it's it's a bit tricky to say are they should they be considered hard or not maybe 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 not so hard but yeah, yeah. yeah i think generally i would say maximum if you would include also sort of that those moderate intensity sessions that you might have in and also you often have these mixed sessions where you have a bit of both in basically i would say um maximally three sessions of that per week there might be weeks where it's you, maybe it's one, there might be weeks where it's two, there might be weeks where it's three. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it varies somewhat within that. Yeah. And um, let's talk about recovery and, and how how that's basically recovery from a programming perspective. You already mentioned that you uh, like to have one or even two uh, a recovery breaking the season up into three you said there in one ex- previous example so so how so you would would you then have one week of full recovery or how how do you break the season up in that way but then also let's talk about how you break the meso and micro cycles up to include to make sure that the athletes recover enough mm-hmm. yes yeah, so if, if we go back to that example that i mentioned about like sort of the annual cycle i think normally what you can identify within yeah, the whole season is like either two or three key phases, depending a little bit uh, on the program, depending on what Grand Tour they're doing, etc. Um, and then those phases would then normally be sort of broken up by yeah, sort of a, re- a recovery or rest block. And perhaps if if you only have a two phase, two phases within that cycle, you might have a slightly longer rest block. If you have three. Uh, phases you might have a slightly shorter rest block but i would say between five to seven days off to break up those phases would be quite typical um so from yeah from like a recovery perspective that's more on a larger level but often even within if you have this phase one that maybe i don't know let's say your first phase lasts until the giro d'italia then obviously within that block you're also going to have these yeah micro recovery moments it's just not like a full reset that you might have breaking up those two uh, two phases um so that's yeah that's a little bit how i would approach it from like a macro perspective and then looking at it more from like i guess a micro perspective i don't necessarily implement like a set i don't know three week on one week off approach um because i, I don't necessarily believe that with very good endurance athletes that you need to have a week of reduced training every three weeks, um, especially when you start building up from the off season. I don't necessarily think that, but I do believe that you need to be yeah, very conscious about implementing these recovery moments within your plan. Um, because if you just get carried away with building and building, I think you're just going to see a plateau or riders getting excessively fatigued. I guess, yeah, how I would, how I would plan that is almost as sort of aligned with other things that are going on. So, um, I, I I like to have the recovery aligned with the psychological side of things. So if there's, I don't know, obviously the most obvious one is that you plan some easy days around Christmas that we're going to be with the family and that they can enjoy that. But there might also be other moments that where they've had a lot of travel or whatever, where you 
see fit to have like a recovery. Yeah, a few days where the the training is somewhat reduced. Um, so I think that's yeah more on a on a weekly basis and then on a day to day perspective. Yeah, you often utilize either two or three day blocks. Um, I guess it's partly from learning from previous coaches than if that's been sort of a typical approach to implement. But also on the other hand, I've tried to do some longer blocks, maybe four or five day consecutive training blocks, and it's it's worked fine. But also I've just seen more instances of riders getting more fatigued. And I didn't really then see the benefit of of doing yeah more than three day blocks. Sometimes I, I was still implemented, but typically I would use like two or three day blocks and then alternate that with a recovery day, but I just ride easy for an hour or something. Um, and yeah, again, that's often based on if how many three day blocks I'm going to do or how many two day blocks I'm going to do. It depends a little bit on yeah logistical considerations. If you have 10, 10 days until the next race, or we have 10 days until the next camp, if I'm, how I'm going to yeah plan in the two and three day blocks depends a little bit on what the travel days and stuff are going to be. Um, so yeah, I think that's how I would periodize the, the recovery either from like a macro level up until yeah within a weekly structure yeah no that's a great uh great answer and we talked a little bit already about how you prescribe training sometimes prescriptively and some sometimes without um well more freely without specific power targets um one follow-up on the training prescription is when you prescribe workouts uh do you always use power and and or rpe or do you also use heart rate uh to prescribe training or any other methods that come into the prescriptional training um yeah so so i i think what i mentioned before is i basically use a combination depending on what the session is going to be so if i don't want an athlete to go over a certain limit as for example with those fat max intervals that we spoke about then i would perhaps be more likely to go uh, go off power um if they for example go to altitude especially in that adaptation block then the heart rate might be more of a guide um just because of yeah, the individual response to altitude and that being more stressful then the heart rate can actually be quite a good indication to keep a limit on the intensity and make sure you don't do too much within those first days um and just generally i look at the heart rate response as an important indicator of adaptation or fatigue um, but from like a prescription perspective i don't utilize it that often but it's yeah altitude or perhaps also with the heat acclimatization acclimation work that could be one yeah that, that we then put more emphasis on um, and then for different sessions i would also implement more of an rpe based approach of give them like a subjective um descriptor on how they should approach a certain interval so i would for example say go off threshold field for 15 minutes um and then just put power off the screen and just go off what they perceive as being threshold at that moment and then analyze the heart rate analyze the power uh afterwards i think why i implement that is for multiple reasons so firstly obviously they need to go off field in a race as well where you can't really go off a set power and um, sometimes you can when a time trial or when it's more of a yeah sad um environment within a race situation you might sometimes go off power but they largely have to go off field as well so they need to almost keep tra practicing this perception of effort um, and for pacing themselves up a climb or during a time trial um and what i said before you know i don't want them i don't want to put a limiter sometimes on the session which you might do if you give them a certain power number and also you don't want to set them up to fail if for some reason they don't have their best day and they don't achieve the number that you're after. Um, and, and, and lastly, I think you RPE based efforts can almost become like an assessment because if you say to a rider, okay, you go 15 minutes of threshold feel and you repeat that throughout the plan. If you then see the power increasing for that same subjective feeling, obviously there's variability within that, but I do think it, it almost becomes a little bit of an assessment and you get quite some valuable information from it. Um, so yeah, generally I, I use different, different ways to prescribe training based on power, heart rate and RPE and, but at all time I would like to collect all the data. So if, even if I don't prescribe much on heart rate, I would like to have heart rate data from every session, because I think there's a lot of valuable information you can get from that. If you know how responsive the heart rate is, how high it is at a certain number and 
it's at a certain power number. I think there's a lot of information you can get from that. Yeah. Um, and how? what about uh, the regular endurance rides, the long, long easy rides or however you call them? How, how do you prescribe them specifically? Do you just... Do you have power targets there or is it just go out and ride at an endurance level, RPE based? Yeah, I think normally I don't per se give them like a set power number. They should stick within for a general ride. Obviously, what I would then typically say, okay, this is a ride endurance ride in zone one. And then within zone one, you have obviously quite a range and then they can just, yeah, sit within that range. And then t basically I would like to keep it relatively free until I see a need to adjust it basically. So if, if I feel that, because like often the zone one can be quite a wide range and obviously it's going to be different physiologically and from a fatigue development perspective, if you, if you do every endurance ride completely at the top end of that range, so there is for sure a difference within that. But given that everything is already very prescriptive, I, I think my first step would be to leave it relatively free, see where they sit. And if it, if I, feel that is good within the sort of larger training picture for that week in terms of their overall training tolerance until I yeah see a need to you know adjust it somewhat. But there might actually there might be days where I would be more conscious with this. So if you've had a very uh, if you have a quite a hard week where we for example have those three intense sessions that we spoke about, then sometimes on these endurance days I want just to make sure that they go really easy enough to not yeah, overload them too much in that week. And then perhaps I would give them sort of a, a set power number that I need to stay below, for example. But generally, I would keep it relatively free. Yeah. Um, is zone one where you would prescribe most of the endurance training or are there times when you would say go in zone two? Um, zone two is obviously a bit of a hot topic, <laughs> has been for for a while. So so that's an interesting uh, interesting. Uh, thing to discuss i think yeah indeed it is and the difficulty al always with these zone discussions is that everybody sets their zone slightly different and then when somebody talks about zone two are they talking about the same zone two that i implement that's yeah that's always something that is uh makes these discussions a little bit more tricky but like generally how i would how i set the zones at least that zone one is what i could then call like the endurance pace and zone two would be um efforts like close to where their maximal fat oxidation would occur. Um, and so the endurance, the general base pace for an endurance ride for me would be in zone one, but there will be endurance rides where we accumulate a lot of time in zone two as well, typically in like longer intervals, 20, 40, maybe even 60 minutes. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, the base pace will be in zone one, but within endurance rides, we often also implement these longer zone two blocks. Yeah. Um, and what kind of testing do you implement and how often and how does that inform training decisions? Yeah. So for me, um, uh, firstly, obviously we, we uh, collect a lot of data in the field. So we are very fortunate with power meters, of course, that we can collect a lot of data on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, the starting point would be to sort of create their power profile and see their ability to do yeah, powers for different durations. And often, uh, let's say I start working with a new athlete, um, I can just analyze their data retrospectively and you look at their what they've collecting, all their training data, all their race data, you get a very good idea what they can do for different durations. Um, so that already gives me information about their profile. Then from more of a testing perspective to set their zones, I, I would typically yeah, I use two two thresholds to set it. One is more of a physiological threshold. So I would like to do an incremental test um, with lactate and ideally also gas exchange measurements to determine sort of where this maximal fat oxidation occurs or where your first lactate turn point will be sort of that sort of transition. Uh, so and that's something I would like to identify from a physiological perspective. Um, to sort of de determine and individualize the lower intensity zone. So let's say everything up until the zone two. And then I would use critical power. Um, so maximal tests of, um, let's say, five minutes and uh, 15 minutes um, or slightly longer, depending on what, what we have used in the past. 
to determine that as the as sort of the second threshold. So use the those two assessments determine critical power. And then we have two thresholds. One is this sort of one physiological marker. And then we have the second functional marker, critical power. And those two combined, I would then use to sort of set set the, the training zones. Um, and also obviously as a marker to to see where they're at. Um so that's yeah, that will be testing that we would do. And then obviously you have maximal efforts and training that you do that's gonna be an assessment of where they're at. Or like, for example, one session that you think is key for their development um, towards their goal, but also something you can repeat where you can see if they actually can do higher numbers for the same amount of, for the same intervals, for example, that's going to give you information of how they're tracking. Um, and then there's, yeah, f- there's a few other little things that I would also implement. So for example, when we're at camp, often we do yeah, some intervals at round zone two or above uh, and then do like a sort of a lat- lactate spot check to see what they're, um, yeah, as a physiological assessment again of, of certain intensities, uh, perhaps also as a confirmation of some of the testing that we might have done indoor, um, and also sometimes implement like a standardized uh, warm up where we collect heart rate and RPE at a certain power, um, also to have another objective marker of yeah how they are progressing basically. Um, so yeah, I think there's a few examples that I mentioned in here that are quite easy to implement throughout. So, you know, this controlled warm-up or these efforts in training, certain key sessions that is are easy to to regularly do throughout the season to track how they are going. And there's obviously others, like for example, the physiological tests or metabolic tests that are a bit more challenging to implement, especially during the season when they're traveling a lot, they're gonna be all over the place. Um, which makes it a bit more tricky, but that is something we yeah, we still start to do. At least, let's say we break that season up into those different phases, as we discussed before, to have at least one of these physiological assessments in every phase. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that makes sense. And uh, so, w- when you say that that they do maximal efforts in training, how w- would that be specifically? Like would you would you use that then to update the critical power or or would it be maximum in the sense that they do a certain set at their maximum ability but it might not give you a a maximum for one given duration? Yeah, the latter basically. So it would be more of a a specific session, sort of a key session that I don't know. We have a key session where what we think works for this rider preparing for a grand tour and. You would you can repeat that session at multiple times throughout the preparation, and then it's more. There, there should be some sort of a RPE um, factor in, or there should be it shouldn't be set. Basically, there shouldn't be a set number because you want to leave some things free to allow them to go max in, in certain elements of that session, and that can be used as a as a guide to see if they're getting better. So let's say we have uh, I don't know a, a fifteen minute effort, but five, the last five minutes of that is used as a sort of free intensity where they can go max. If they do higher numbers in one session compared to the one before, obviously that's a bit of a gauge of how they're yeah if they are improving. But it's not going to be a five minute fresh uh, peak power assessment that you would perhaps use for to set their critical power. So it's it's indeed a little bit uh, separate from that. Hmm. One thing that has been discussed a lot in the last couple of years is the concept of durability and uh, testing when fatigued after expending a certain amount of kilojoules usually. Is that something that you implement? Um, basically, yes. But like, if I would try to make an assessment if if somebody's fatigue resistant or not or if somebody, if the rider is durable or not, my first step would be again to look at it retrospectively. And then just look at these different, so look at what their fresh power profile looks like. So their ability to do, I don't know, five, 10, 20 minutes max, look at what the power is for those different durations. And then if, you, if I have a whole season worth of data, then also look at like after certain kilojoules per kilo or after a certain amount of kilojoules, after after accumulating workload, what then their best numbers are for different durations. And if you have, obviously you need to, there's some bias in there because you need to know if they actually did maximal efforts at after those different workload levels. But if you have a large amount of data, I think you can get a 
decent picture how much the power drops after previously accumulating workload. So that would just be a retrospective analysis where I already think you can get an idea if somebody is fatigue resistant or not. Alongside, obviously, other factors, if you have a certain climber that is always good in the, in on the last climb, but perhaps doesn't have the best fresh numbers, there's obviously m- multiple indications that you can get if somebody is yeah, durable or not. Um, so that, that would be sort of my first ass- assessment that I do retrospectively. And then also within certain sessions, um, yeah, you're going to accumulate certain training sessions. You're going to accumulate quite some workload before you get to a, a, a key effort. And that's again, going to give you, um, give you information. So if for some rider, he decays quite a bit or he struggles to produce close to what he could normally do for a certain duration after doing a lot of zone two or zone three intervals that obviously gives also gives you also information. So it's then again, a training session that you see as valuable, but at the same time also gives you information that you're after. Because if they always struggle in that last interval in the last hour, then that's going to give you information. And uh, so, so one more question that, that I'm interested in is if you could give a specific example of a training week for for a world tour cyclist. You don't have to name any names, but uh, yeah, just uh, talk us through what the week looks like and, and where in the season that that week like lies, so we get some some context for it. Um, yeah, like I, I think obviously when if we go back a little bit to the previous discussions we had. Yeah, the first answer is always going to be that's going to depend a little bit on the rider characteristics and, and the goals are going to be after. But yeah, I was, for example, working on the the yeah, one of the plans for one of the altitude camps that we have coming up for the yeah, riders that are preparing a ground tour, specifically the GC contenders. So, for example, if you think about one of the key weeks that we would do there, I think from like a volume perspective, yeah, it would be generally we would have quite a high volume for this type of athlete especially in the key phase leading into a grand tour so the week might look like that they're yeah doing around 30 hours on the bike that week um and if they're specifically preparing um a gc contender so there will be quite a large amount of yeah, climbing efforts within that um so or at least efforts with like a longer sustained element and that can be both on a tt bike because that's obviously going to be a key factor for a grand tour typically or it will be um yeah sustained efforts uh uphill so climbing efforts basically and then we would combine that with yeah, quite some fat max intensity and also this sort of medio or zone three type intensity combined with with threshold efforts um and then we also have some elements above threshold so let's say your typical few to max type efforts um if you want to call them like that but the magnitude of that will vary a little bit per per individual but so the general approach would be to have generally high volume let's say 30 hours maybe sometimes higher for some and then have actually quite some exposure um yeah, in sort of this the, the moderate intensity domain um and in a specific phase this will also include that quite some threshold work because that's obviously going to be yeah a quality that you want to develop as as high as possible um for gc container leading into a grand tour if you have the plan and if it's okay, could you list Monday through Sunday just the volume of each day and the, the type of efforts that you ha- would have on, on that day? Yeah, so if, let's say we look at a, at a week structure, so then um, let's say Monday would be recovery day, then we could do a three-day block Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, then a Tuesday could be, for example, around five hours with some of these climbing efforts that we discussed. Um, then the Wednesday could be let's say around four hours which also includes tt efforts and then a long general ride on the um, on the friday basically um then another recovery day uh what, what about what about sorry was that first day or friday so, or did you miss first thursday is then the long general ride sorry and then friday would be yep. uh the recover another recovery day and then we would finish the week with a two-day block on on saturday and sunday basically um and again that would be one day with where we do these climbing efforts and then combine that with another long general day on the on the sunday so it could be for example five hours and six hours again right um and uh i want to ask some questions more related to science as well obviously because you are uh still uh doing research and publishing and have done a lot of 
applied work, which I think is really interesting. So working within with data from the world tour and, and publishing on that. Um, but yeah, so what I want to ask you first is what is the most important research that you have done that helps you inform your coaching practice? Yeah, that's not an easy one to answer because it's basically I learned something from every study that we did, not per se, not only the outcome of the study, I guess, but also just going through the process. So if you design, when we designed one of these training studies for my PhD, just thinking about ways to assess them and how to monitor the training and try to collect the data in a good way. I think that there's always something that I think, yeah, I took from every research project that we did. Um, but yeah, if I, if I look back, I think we just discussed this the durability concept or fatigue resistance or whatever you want to call it. But obviously we also did a, a study into this and this is yeah, something I always, I was always sort of thinking about and I've had some discussions already quite some time ago about this whole concept of looking at a fresh power profile. Is that really going to give you all the information you need for yeah, a cyclist to be successful? Because we just had these examples of at least that were really good when you did a fresh effort in training, but it never, or it, it didn't translate to what we often saw in practice. And they just weren't able to do some of those numbers, close to those numbers in racing that they were able to do in training. So I think that, yeah, for t that going through that whole process of evaluating that, that concept, I think that was quite valuable. And was, I guess, a bit more of a confirmation of things that we were, that we were thinking already before. Um, but then one other thing I can actually think about is, and that's outside of cycling, but I was at a, a supervisor for a PhD student at the university of, uh, Sterling, so James Stockdale, and he was actually looking in talent identification in youth soccer players. Um, but actually there again, I, from that project, I it can take a lot of good points from i remember one study that he did looking sort of in a longitudinal overview into youth soccer players and what actually determined success so they did a lot of assessments when they were young at different age groups and then looked at which of those players actually went into a professional club eventually so it was it was a really cool study um where the data was really nicely collected um and one of the things we, we took out of that was um, that it wasn't necessarily the early performance at a young age that determined the success, but it was more, so it wasn't the starting point of, you know, whatever assessment they did when they were nine or 10, but it was more how much they progressed uh, each year. So like the level of progression or the percentage improvement they shown moving from one age group to the other was more determined of their probability of achieving this pro contract after. So yeah, again, that was something I, I found super interesting and I think, yeah, from every study that we did, I, I learned a lot. But if I would pick out yeah, some, I think those two two studies, I definitely took a lot from. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating, actually, and uh, and it makes some sense, especially in cycling. You see, some, I mean, of course, a lot of most athletes probably have cycled for a large part of the years, but you have, of, co of course have these examples of people coming from rowing or ski jumping or various other sports. And, and I guess that if you actually looked at their progression when they first got into cycling, it would be absolutely through the roof. And, and that would be quite indicative of then what they went on to achieve uh, as, as cyclists and, and are uh, achieving still. So, so I think that that's an interesting concept with the talent identification uh, for sure. Um, and a similar question along the same lines. So beyond research that you have been personally involved with, are, are there any other things that you think that, within all of the sports science that exists, this is something that really helps you in your coaching practice. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the research that, I think a lot of the research on like the environmental or environmental physiology, I think that for sure has helped me quite a bit yeah, in my day-to-day -day coaching practice. For example, all the research that's been done on altitude training, there's, there's so much out there now. There's still a lot of things that we don't really know and that we want to you know, know more about, but I guess like altitude training is one of those things where you can really be a quite science-based in how you design your altitude training. So the science is quite clear that, you know, you need to be above, or ideally you're above 2000 meters. That ideal exposure time is at least three weeks. So there's all these things that 
came out of these mechanistic studies on altitude training that now help when we're trying to design a camp, for example. Um, same goes for research on heat training and heat acclimation. Again, there's quite some nice studies on this coming out in recent years where the strategies that are applied within those studies in terms of frequency of heat exposure, what core temperature you want to be above, etc. That's all yeah, strategies or, or methods that you could directly implement also within within practice. So I think that's been yeah, that's for sure been uh, something that's been quite impactful. And then I think generally it's just the research on stress that I've been yeah, find quite interesting. Like stress from like a physiological perspective, but also stress from a psychological perspective. And for example, some of the studies that come out with uh, linking that with HRV and yeah, just this, this concept of stress in general. I think we touched upon it already a few times that how to consider all the stressors also outside of training. And I think, yeah, the research on that has also yeah, been quite impactful. How do you, how do you do that with your, with your athletes? Do you, do, do your athletes measure HRV? Do they do some sort of, um, I don't know, comms or something like that? Or is it just a text message asking them, Hey, how are you doing? Uh, how, how do you implement it in your coaching? Yeah. So, so generally I would say it's a combination of some objective markers. Um, so for, for example, uh, HRV or resting heart rate, um, which would, there's, we are more fortunate now that there's more devices who can measure that validly and reliably. Um, so some of those objective data, also obviously the heart rate response during training and all that, you can get a lot of a lot from too. And then combining that with just, yeah, subjective information. And it's, I don't have like a set question or something I would go through, but it's more indeed just having the chat with the athlete, how they're doing, how fatigued they're feeling, how tired they're feeling and putting all of that sort of subjective feedback in context with the objective data. And then based on that, you yeah, make a decision if you want to reduce training or you keep going. Um, and there's going to be some points like in the key phases, for example, when we go to altitude, where you're going to make this yeah more structured, where they might actually, I don't know, answer like a certain um, subjective question on uh, sleep quality and fatigue and soreness not like a full psychometric questionnaire, but at least having a bit more structure in how you collect that data and then alongside resting heart rate and uh, saturation data that yeah you want to collect in, in, in specific phases as well. But yeah, the, in the end, the, the chat you're going to have with the athlete, especially when you're going to be with them in person at a camp, that's you're going to get the most information from in the end. Yeah. And uh, is there any research that you would like to see done by yourself or by others that that would be yeah that, that would be really valuable for you as a coach if it was conducted um yeah well, i actually mentioned the altitude training before and like a lot of positive things that we can or a lot of good strategies we can take from that i think the one thing that is not too much known about there's some research coming out or it's some research that came out in the last uh, year or so, but it's about sort of this natural versus simulated altitude. So now you have like access to these sort of altitude hotels where they have a, uh, where they simulate altitude or you obviously athletes have access to altitude tents. And so you have, you have the ability to provide a hypoxic stimulus in a non altitude, non natural altitude environment, um, which is obviously quite an interesting concept, but at the moment, um, my preference would still be to go to a natural altitude location. Obviously, you have the pressure difference. Um, that is the differentiating, differentiating factor between natural and simulated altitude. But yeah, I think just I would like to see a bit more understanding about how what the differences are between those two and how they could potentially complement each other. Because they might act, the benefit of an altitude tent, for example, is that you can have it at home. And it's a bit, you know, obviously it's easier to have like a sleep high strategy with an altitude tent at home and be a bit more adjustable with that, even if, especially if you have like shorter blocks that you might want to implement that and see how you can, I, yeah, optimally combine that with, for example, a, a long or natural altitude camp. And there's not much research on that yet. So doing the current, um, implementing that currently is, yeah, a bit more on, yeah theoretical concept and own thinking but uh, it would be interesting to see more research on that but it's not easy research to do but it would be 
would be something nice to see. Yeah, for sure. No, that's a really interesting one. Uh, maybe maybe you can extend uh, um, the acute adaptations from altitude by, by a certain exposure to yeah. simulated altitude or, or something like that. Um, and a few questions uh, relevant for for amateur cyclists and endurance athletes uh, to finish off, what do you think that amateurs could learn from world tour cyclists? And what do you think they should not try to do the same or, or not, not learn from, from the professionals? Um, I think that the most important thing for just an endurance athlete in general, if you're a world tour cyclist or if you're a um, amateur cyclist is that you try to be as consi- consistent as possible with your training and trying to sort of design your life that allows that you have consistency within your training. So obviously with a world tour cyclist who has such a high volume, if you want to, if he wants to make sure that he can consistently have that high volume, he needs to prioritize living a healthy lifestyle with nutrition and sleep, prioritizing recovery. Um, so I think that's obviously something that as a, amateur cyclist is going to be a lot more difficult because you're going to have a lot more stressors. Like if if you're going to be working full time and still training alongside, there's a lot more things that you have to, that you have to consider. And you obviously don't have the support that, uh, yeah, professional cyclist, the uh, cyclist might have. Um, so that, yeah, obviously there's a bit of a, yeah, a contrast there, but I, th- I think just trying to be, as consistent as possible and prioritizing a healthy lifestyle, prioritizing your recovery as much as possible, which is going to be more challenging if you have a lot more stressors. But yeah, that's something I think Walter cyclists are very good at trying to eliminate as much as besides hiking, try to eliminate as much as other stuff. They are in a fortunate position that they can do that. But if you're amateur cyclist, that is not going to be as easy. But if you want to ensure that you can do your, also do your training alongside your other commitments, you might have to, yeah, prioritize certain things to make sure it allows you to do that. What about things not to do? Are there any, let's say, myths or misconceptions, things popularized in media or social media that you think that, well, actually, this is maybe not such a smart idea for amateurs to try to to imitate? It's, it's perhaps not the, perhaps that it's, it's not per se harmful, this, but it's more, like, as you say, there's a lot of things you can, read on the internet and they you can they see a lot of perhaps articles about professional cyclists doing these i don't know more extreme nutritional strategies or they have these different recovery modalities and whatever or they might have all these gadgets to measure a core temperature or but that that's that's obviously going to be the that's with athletes that are focusing on the lost percentages basically but i think for an amateur cyclist that should the focus shouldn't be on that it should be focusing on the basics like we discussed before trying to pro- prioritize a healthy lifestyle prioritize your recovery have good nutrition those basics basics are going to be more important than the most advanced gadget to measure muscle oxygenation or whatever um so i think i think that's um yes yeah, something i would say and then also um yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of research on the intensity distribution and this 80-20 and all that. And I think if you don't train as much, yeah, it's, it just, for for an endurance athlete, you're automatically, if you do a high volume, you're automatically going to accumulate a lot of volume at the lower intensity, right? It's just a consequence of yeah, having such a high volume. And I wouldn't necessarily then blindly follow what the intensity distribution of a professional cyclist might be directly also for somebody that has more limited time to train. Um, so that's, yeah, that's how I would look at it. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, example uh, or a great point. And, and that leads in nicely to my next question, which is if you are an amateur cyclist with, let's say, seven to 10 hours to train, I think it's, it's still somebody who is serious about their sport and want to improve and so on, but that's the, the number of hours they have in the week. So how would you maximize that time? Mm. Yeah, let's say it would be I would start working with an athlete that would have that amount of time to train. Then, like the first thing I would try to understand is what yeah what the actual goal is. That might be quite different. Like if it's you know it can be either just having fun or losing weight or staying fit. Um, so that could be a goal, and that might change a little bit how you try to approach it. 
Um, but it, there's obviously also keen amateur cyclists that are really preparing for a certain event, the Grand Fondo or amateur race or whatever. So then obviously they're going to be quite, they're going to put a lot of value in trying to do as good as possible in this certain event. Um, so that's one thing I would just then try to understand. Um, and then the second thing I would like to understand is then like how we can match training and life basically. So obviously if you have a very busy schedule with work and that's going to determine how, yeah, how much training you would actually be doing, uh, could be doing, but we just want to make sure that that is sort of matched, um, that if you have quite a stressful job and you know, you certain days where you're full gas all day, and then you still have to train afterwards, that's all going to influence, um, yeah, what you can do on certain days. So I would look, try to look at ways to distribute your, the training amongst your life, basically. So that would be more from like a general perspective. And if I would, yeah, look at it from more, uh, training principle perspective, I would probably look to spread out the frequency across the week. So let's say you're able to do eight hours of training in a week. I would prefer that that spread out perhaps over four sessions than or three or four sessions than that you only have time in a weekend because your job is that busy during the week that you can you do twice four hours in the weekend that would be like what one principle i would have um but yeah so let's say let's say we have three sessions that we can implement and i would yeah have like one longer ride in the weekend so obviously the day where you're going to have the most time that you go somewhat longer and then try to fit in two shorter rides during the week and then one way to divide it would be to have one we put yeah more of this moderate intensity and then perhaps one with yeah some higher intensity um again what i said before if you're going to distribute it like that you're going to have a different intensity distribution than what a pro would be just because of the lower volume you have but yeah that could be one example of how you at least would distribute those uh different sessions but then the other thing i would try to look into is in the end if you want to become a better endurance athlete as we said before the volume is going to be a key determinant, especially just this yeah, low intensity aerobic stimulus. How the more we can give that, the more likely it is that you're going to yeah see these adaptations and become a better endurance athlete. So then I would try to look at if are there like smart opportunities throughout the week where we can add more of this aerobic stimulus without it necessarily feeling like that it's training time that's. Uh, detracting from the rest of the things you want to get done basically so i don't know ride a bike to work or get certain walks in during the day or whatever we can think about at least just try to look at opportunities in the week to add more aerobic stimuli without it being necessarily like a, seeing it as a full-on training session it might be you know, a long walk with the with the wife or whatever just that would be something that we just give as a, as a general advice um, and then obviously it's, it's going to be quite a, you're going to have a lot of load during the week, not only from training, but just from work and all the other events that you have going on. So just make sure you have a healthy lifestyle, you know, sleeping properly, good nutrition, just basics. But if you want to, yeah, if you want to improve, that has to be in place. Yeah, no, that's a very good answer. Uh, thank you for that. And um, let's finish off with the rapid fire questions. So take just one sentence to answer these. And the first one is, what's your favorite book or resource related to endurance sports? I'll do two sentences. <laughs> and the one thing is, it's not, oh, yeah, that's not an easy one to answer because I've, I read quite a lot of books. And it's, again, I take something from, from uh, all of them. But if if I would have to pick one for endurance sports, one I found super interesting is the science of running by Steve Magnus. I already, I think the first time I read it has been quite some time ago. Um, and but yeah, I still reread some of the chapters, and I think it's, I think it's a very good book. Like he goes into different physiological profiles: more fast twitch dominant, more slow twitch dominant, and what does that mean for? some of the efforts you might prescribe and i think i think it's super and super interesting we can obviously it's in a, it's in running so it's different to cycling but i think a lot of the principles would hold also in an other endurance sport so yeah the science of running is i would definitely recommend and uh what's an important habit that you have benefited from athletically professionally or personally um i think yeah i think the main thing is just that i'm uh i i'm quite lucky that i found something that I really enjoy doing. So I'm very passionate about what I do. And I think the 
the passion I have for what I do results in the the habits of the world. So if you're very passionate about what you do, then I think automatically you're going to be more disciplined and driven to be better. And I think it's, yeah, in the end, the habits will be linked to the passion I have for what I do. And uh, who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? Um, generally I would say people that are really good at something like that's, I've always been super interested in that regardless of what area they're in It's like when I, uh, like I watch a lot of documentaries about wide variety of different things and just uh, somebody that's really good at something that's really dedicated themselves to their craft and try to improve at something I've always been super interested in. So I think that, yeah, generally, and then, um, yeah, Secondly, I think you had you had Louis de la Haye on the podcast as well, right? So he, yeah, he's yeah. a from a coaching perspective, he's for sure somebody that I look up to. Yeah, he lives actually quite close to me. I, it's not always easy with our schedules, but I still try to meet up with him when I can. And yeah, he's definitely someone that I look up to and uh, yeah, value his view and opinion. Yeah, uh, no, I I remember that interview. I thought that it was it was great. I'll put the link in the show notes, uh, so listeners can go and uh, check it out. He at the time anyway, he was working with the Dutch Triathlon Federation just to uh, give some context. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, just finally, where can listeners follow you on social media, online, or elsewhere? I'm I've been I'm uh, on Twitter uh, at Dio Sandos and. Recently, I'm also on Instagram. Um, should be the same handle, actually. So, uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dio. It was great to chat to you. Hope to do it again another time. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. You can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com and we will have links to uh, Dio's uh, social media and research gate where you can find all of his uh, published uh, research. Also, some episodes we mentioned, uh, including, or one episode mentioned, included uh, Louis de la Haye, who was on in episode 301. Definitely recommend listening to that. I really enjoyed that interview. And also, one of uh, Dio's colleagues and top co-authors in the academic world is uh, uh, Dr. Theon van Erp, uh, who was on in episode 250. And uh, I believe that Theon also coaches at Ineos now, although I may be mistaken, but he has at least been with them and in the past also with uh, Team DSM. So that one I will link to as well, because as I said, him and I have worked together on a lot of uh, research and we talk a bit more about the, uh, the research side of things in the interview with Theon. One thing that I just want to briefly mention is that we, we did uh, want to talk about an example training week uh, for a World uh, Tour cyclist, but that just wasn't possible due to team policy. So we have to accept that. And unfortunately, we couldn't include that in the episode, uh, not for lack of wanting to, but uh, that is uh, the team's uh, policy. So we had to had to abide by that. Next Monday, uh, we have a Q&A coming up on run training with scientific triathlon coach James Teagle. This will already be recorded by the time you hear this, so uh, the people that have sent in questions have done so already. Uh, but uh, make sure that you tune in because we have a lot of questions that will go through and a lot of uh, good run training content in the triathlon context, but also a few questions uh, for pure runners. Uh, if you want to improve your triathlon performance and want help to achieve your goals, then consider working with a scientific triathlon coach or training plan. We have options for athletes of all different levels and uh, no matter the size of your goals, also for different budgets. And a few points to highlight that reduce the barrier to get started is that we have no minimum commitment term nor startup fee for coaching. And for training plans, we have a 100% satisfaction guarantee for plans purchased on our website and an exchange guarantee. So you can exchange your plan for another plan if you purchase through Training Peaks. We also have consultation and customized plan options that you can check out. Find out more and contact contact us on scientifictriathlon.com and we can discuss your specific goals and needs and see what's best for you and uh, big thanks to our sponsors form that you can find on formswim.com forward slash tts 
improve your sim training with real-time metrics like pace, stroke rate, and heart rate, and advanced post swim analysis. And use the code TTS15 to get 15% off the form smart swim goggles. And thank you to Zen8. Use the Zen8 swim training to improve your technique, power, stamina, and swim training consistency. You can try the Zen8 risk-free for up to 30 days and get the special Zen8 and TTS bundle that includes the swim trainer and a number of Zen8 training plans and on-demand workouts on zen8swimtrainer.com for slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft life.